Hello, and welcome to the Washington Institute. I'm Rob Satloff, the Executive Director of the Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this very special event. Words like unprecedented, seismic, historic, we throw them around like confetti on a normal New Year's Eve, but there's no doubt that the terms apply to our current situation. As we continue with the worst public health crisis in a century, the worst economic crisis in nearly as long, we have just witnessed what many believe to be the most serious and deadly threat to our republic in 160 years. In 10 days, we will inaugurate a new president who inherits all this, as well as a world beset by crises and challenges, in the Middle East, of course, being no exception. At moments like this, it makes sense to seek the wisdom of experience, and it's therefore a great privilege to host this event with our special guest, former Prime Minister, Tony Blair. Mr. Blair is executive chairman of the London-based Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. He's the winner of three consecutive elections to serve as British Prime Minister, the only labor leader ever to do so. He's one of the few true statesmen of our era. In fact, we confirmed that at the Washington Institute by awarding him our Scholar Statesman Medal, our highest honor in 2010. It's now 10 years later, and we are delighted to host this event with Mr. Blair at this consequential hour in the history of our nation and our world. Welcome, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, thank you, Rob, it's a great pleasure. I think it makes sense to begin with the events of last week. I won't ask you to comment on our domestic politics, but rather on the impact of recent events on America's global standing and the leadership that people around the world hope to see from Washington and from a President Biden to address all the collective issues uh, that we have to face. Mr. Blair. Well, to state the obvious, it, it was shocking and dismaying for America's many friends around the world to see what happened. I think there's two things though, apart from the obvious that, that is important to state and which I have been doing to, to people here in, in the UK and and elsewhere when I'm speaking, which is first to say that despite the outrage, your constitution held firm, your country holds firm. Joe Biden will be duly sworn in as president in a short period of time. And, you know, it's important that we, we condemn what has happened, but it's also important that we realize America stay strong and stays firm. Secondly, um, Joe Biden as president-elect is pretty much the right man in the right place at the right time, I would say, because he is deeply experienced. He's by instinct someone who tries to reach out uh, to those that disagree as well as those who agree. And you know, your politics has exploded onto the world stage by what had happened um, uh, last week, but many of the fissures in American politics and American society are mirrored right around the Western world right now. I mean, they, they haven't taken as ugly and um, extraordinary form as they did in, in, in Washington last week, but, you know, it's also go, going to be important for American politics to start to heal itself, because that will also give some solace to those of us in other countries who also see our politics deeply, deeply divided. Thank you. Um, before we continue, I want to invite our viewers in America and around the world, um, if you have questions that I will uh, try to filter into this conversation, please do um, email them directly to me at rsatloff at washingtoninstitute.org, or if you're inside the webinar, please use the Q&A function to address your questions uh, directly to me. Um, Mr. Blair, let's, let's ask about the strategic implications of the pandemic um, beyond addressing just public health priorities in each of our countries. In what way do you think the pandemic has changed international politics and affected the uh, national security agenda of the new administration? One of the things my institute's done in the past year is virtually repurpose itself um, to studying COVID, the right responses, the right policies in terms of things like testing, vaccination, and, and so on. Um, 
the bad news, the challenging news, is that this virus is mutating. I think you, you've got to look at this as a struggle over several years, I'm afraid. Um, and we are going to be trying to chase the virus out at the same time as the virus is mutating and changing. You know, we, we may well get to a point where we have to adapt or vary the vaccines that we're using. Um, so here are, the, here are the things that I think are very, very clear. Number one, what the pandemic has exposed are profound flaws in the global health architecture. Um, data surveillance, we didn't spot this soon enough and get the right data objectively so that we could see what was happening. Um, vaccine development, we should be making preparations now for a whole series of families of potential pathogen that you could, you could have that would result in a pandemic for the future. Uh, we don't have that research capability in place at the moment. Vaccine production and development is centered in various parts of the world, but we, we don't have a coherent developed global policy to make sure we have vaccine production um, at, its, at its optimal. You know, you've got something like 200 different vaccine attempts going on around the world when the most we're ever gonna need is probably under 10 vaccines. And then you've got real anxieties, I think, on the part of governments as to what the right advice is to follow. And one of the debates, for example, we've just been having in the UK, where, where, which I've been prominent in, is, is and it originally came out of my suggestion to have for these two dose vaccines, provided the first dose gets you an immunity over 70%, then it's actually sensible not to hold back vaccine, but to get vaccine rolled out as swiftly as possible. But you know, you need expert guidance on a lot of these things. Some of the approvals for vaccines and therapeutic drugs have taken a very long time. The, the trial process, because for example, the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is the one I've been most closely involved in, I mean, that basic vaccine has been there since March, right? You've got to look at how do you accelerate then the trial and testing procedures before you, you pass these vaccines, because in future, we've got to shorten the period between a, a pandemic beginning and getting on top of it with, with um, good vaccines. So I think there's a mass of things there that the new administration can come in and help globally coordinate because you know, if there was coordination on these things, think how much better off we would have been if, for example, the world had come together and said, right, we are going to incentivize rapid on the spot antigen testing. We're going to put together a fund. We're going to back every single solution that we can to make these tests as accurate as we can. We would have got there months earlier than now when we're starting to get these tests that are now accurate coming on stream. So there's one big thing, I think, for the new administration, which is around the global pandemic itself and the case for multilateral action, not to push to one side the interests of each country, but because enlightened self-interest means you're better off cooperating. Secondly, I think that the American-European relationship is of vital importance, not just because of the pandemic, because of issues like climate and, and what we do about China policy, and thirdly, I think the single biggest thing that people are looking for from the incoming administration is strategic predictability. In other words, that when you've got a problem, there is a strategy, not a series of ad hoc reactions, a strategy in place that your allies can get behind. So there's some things for starters. <laughs> so, I mean, first of all, your observation that this is going to be a years long, not months long, um, uh, challenge is uh, very sobering, I'm sure, to, to many people watching. Um, secondly, uh, uh, even without the pandemic, there would be a very long list of items on the new administration's uh, national security foreign policy agenda. Um, how, wh what advice would you give in terms of separating out the urgent from the important in terms of what the president himself focuses on early on? It's always difficult because the problem in politics is that, you know, you get to your, you get your, um, you get your freedom to decide what your response is to a situation, but you don't always get the freedom to decide what the situation is. And, 
you know, I would have thought that the president will focus, first of all, on the pandemic itself. But what I'm really saying is part of that focus is actually getting global cooperation going. Secondly, of course, I think the issues around China will be immensely important, issues around the Middle East and Iran, which I know we'll come on to later, um, but also just re-establishing a very strong link with the other side of the Atlantic, because all of these problems are gonna be easier to deal with if we deal with them together. Um, let me ask you uh, about, when you look at the globe, um, where does, in your view, the Middle East fit in? Um, is it, uh, a, 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 I mean, last time we had this conversation, it was 10 years ago. It was just weeks before uh, the Arab Spring was triggered in Tunisia. Uh, we, we, we had a conversation in October of 2010, just weeks before. Now it's a totally different environment. Um, uh, where does the Middle East fit in on the global agenda? Is it a, a setting of great power competition? Is it, is it much less important than ever before? How would, you, how would you assess that? Okay, so I, th I think there's a big debate about this, but my, my view, you know, whether people agree with it or not, my, my view is very clear. The Middle East still matters. It matters enormously. It matters because it's in the Middle East that the future of Islam will be decided. Uh, does it um, do the modernizing forces within uh, Islam predominate and come out on top? It's going to be important because it impacts not just the Middle East itself, but North Africa and increasingly Sub-Saharan Africa. So the Middle East has got, you know, if you're a European, you know, and you're looking at where your next waves of migration and extremism could come from, they're likely to come out of the Sahel group of countries um, and North Africa. So the Middle East in the broader sense, the broader region, Middle East, North Africa, it remains incredibly important. And, you know, we, we, we published actually a very good essay today from Dr. Eman al-Badawi, who works at, um, in my institute on trying to frame the question in the Middle East today. And look, again, a lot of people would disagree with this, but in my view, there are some signs for optimism if we analyze what's going on in the Middle East correctly. And, in my view, you should look at the Middle East as really about one big struggle, which is the desire, particularly of the younger generation in the Middle East, to get to what I would call rule-based economies and religiously tolerant societies. And, you know, that is a growing group of people. They want to know that if they work hard and play by the rules, they can form businesses, they can do well and you know they can raise their families and stability and they increasingly there's a, there's a generation there that understand that this is why obviously the rapprochement between um, Arab states and Israel is so important they understand that in the end the only future for the Middle East is to get connected to the world and part of that connectivity is to be religiously tolerant and open-minded towards those of different faiths and cultures so I think when it comes to western policy you know, you stretch back over a long period of time, as obviously I do, 9-11, um, then Iraq and all the difficulties there, and then the Arab Spring and all the difficulties that came from that. I mean, there's been turmoil in the Middle East, but even amongst all the turmoil, there have been attempts to reach for something better. And it's important, I think, we don't lose sight of that big picture um, struggle within the Middle East, because in the end, it is a struggle that isn't just a big power competition and all of that, nor is it a struggle between Shia and Sunni, in my view, nor is it a struggle for power. It is also about values, and those values are values which echo our own, that struggle, or one side of that struggle. And therefore, it's very, very important, I think, that we continue to recognize that the Middle East matters. It's of fundamental importance. and. There are people that we should be backing within the region, um, and there are people we should be pushing back against. Uh, since people are looking for, for uh, any, um, any signs of optimism, um, uh, uh, could you tell us one or two of the most optimistic aspects of this that, uh, that embolden you, that give you, give you hope? Yeah, I mean, 
First of all, I think the rapprochement between the Arab states and Israel is a great cause for hope. And, and also, by the way, the, the peace there, if you look at what's happening with the UAE and Israel, which obviously I had a lot to do with because my, my institute has been working in these last years since I stood down from the quartet on the Arab-Israeli rapprochement. And I've said for a long time, this is actually the way to resolve the Palestinian issue as well, by the way. But, you know, that is a, who, who would have, what would have been the odds of that sometime before? And it's still got a long way to go and it can go a lot further. I mean, I've no doubt at all that in the end, this will become a, a significant part of the new architecture in the Middle East. And by the way, I think it, it's going to be a warm piece, not a cold piece. And that is also extremely important. So that's one thing. I think the second thing is when you analyze the attitudes of many of the youth in the region, you know, their attitudes are increasingly open-minded. You know, yes, of course, there are some young people getting pulled into jihadism and terrorism and so on, but there are a lot of others who, who are on the other side of that, including in Iran itself, by the way. So I think, you know, it's a young population. The Arab Spring was a, you know, as I think I tried to say at the time, having gone through regime change my, myself as a leader in Iraq and Afghanistan and so on, the danger was always what happens when you, you have a whole lot of people come together for different reasons to get rid of the status quo. But once the status quo is removed, there's no real agreement as to what takes place afterwards. So you had a huge battle post the Arab Spring between more liberal elements and then you know, Islamist elements, the Muslim Brotherhood and so on. But I think increasingly as time goes on, there is an emerging new generation even post that Arab Spring generation that is looking at this in a, in a different way altogether and in a much more positive way. So um, although I've no doubt at all you could look, I mean, obviously you could look at the Middle East today and just become relentlessly pessimistic, but I think there are grounds for optimism. So you've just opened uh, um, uh, the aperture for a couple of different uh, discussions. First, let me ask you about um, the idea that uh, uh, President-elect Biden and his team have said that they would like to re-inject um, democracy and human rights as more important elements in American foreign policy. Um, uh, correcting, uh, that correcting the flaws of our allies are as important as, as identifying and condemning the flaws of our adversaries. Um, uh, now from your experience as a leader who, who made values an important part of your foreign policy, and given the experience of the last 10 years when we had mixed results, shall we say. Uh, what's the most effective way of doing this? Well, I think it's, it's still extremely important that issues to do with human rights and democracy are still major issues for, for, for Western governments because it's part of our value system and what we believe in. I think what I have learned over time is that it is important though to see whether a country is moving in the right direction or not, and whether therefore it's important to engage, even if you've got criticisms on human rights, and those criticisms may be absolutely right and necessary to make, but nonetheless, you can perceive that there is a, ultimately a move towards a better society. And therefore, when I look at the Middle East today, for me, it's important when you look at individual countries, you may well and correctly raise human rights questions, but in that big struggle that I've described on modernization, rule-based economies, religious tolerance, if governments are on the right side of that divide, it's still important to engage and support them in that, even if you have your criticisms. So I think, you know, this is, this is, this is going to become a, a, a very difficult question, but I think it's important to realize that the reason why people like myself, for example, have supported so strongly the modernization program, UAE, Saudi Arabia, and so on, is not because we think in a transactional way, well, these are our allies and therefore you've just got to line up with them. It's because we do see genuine changes happening of a very important nature that it's important to support even if 
you're also having areas of criticism. And, and this is why I think, I don't think there's any good policy for the Middle East today that doesn't start from a comprehensive analysis of what has been right and wrong since the turn of the century and doesn't at least have one big framing argument for how you see that struggle in the Middle East. Because otherwise I think you end up in a situation where, as I was alluding to earlier, you know, I hear a lot of people who say, well, it's really a struggle, you know, Iran versus Saudi Arabia is really a struggle, but Shia versus Sunni, no, it's not. It really isn't in the end. It's a struggle between those people that in the end want to say that religion and one view of one religion, namely one view of Islam, should dominate and be turned into a political ideology, and those people who don't. And that is a profound and fundamental divide. And it's important, I think, we take cognizance, cognizance of that, because otherwise you end up in a situation where you, you, you misunderstand the process of change that's, that's going on in the Middle East, and you end up really in the end thinking, well, isn't it better we just wash our hands of the whole thing, which I think would be a big mistake. Um, uh, again, um, if you have questions for Mr. Blair, and I have quite a few questions already since we have, as I see, um, um, quite uh, an enormous number of viewers on, uh, on our various platforms. If you have questions, please send them to me at rsatloff at washingtoninstitute.org. Um, just on this issue, I have a number of people who are asking me, how should we deal with leaders who are, who are themselves uh, very difficult on the human rights democracy issue? Um, not just regimes, and uh, whether it's uh, uh, President Trump's favorite dictator, or the president of Egypt, um, or the leader of uh, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, are are there things that are that that, that you would urge the Biden administration to do to to uh, move this in a more constructive direction? Well, I think you know the important thing is to say, well, what is your actual assessment of the situation now? My assessment is, for example, in respect of, of Saudi Arabia, that yes, you, you can make some strong criticisms and people do, and those criticisms are, are, are rightly made. On the other hand, there's no doubt there are, there are real modernizing developments there that are important, elements of social change, elements of religious change. You know, you compare the, the relationship of Saudi Arabia to the peace process with the Palestinians, Arab peace initiative in the early part of the century, now support for the rapprochement with Israel, even though Saudi Arabia is not itself um, part of that yet. Uh, but nonetheless, it's given a fair win to the UAE's rapprochement with, with uh, Israel, which is really, really important. You compare and contrast that with the Islamic Republic of Iran that is supporting those elements that want to destroy any hope of peace and destroy Israel itself. So I just think you need to be, you need to be judicious which is not to say that you turn a blind eye to human rights abuses. No, you, you should raise them. Um, but you should also praise where the praise is due for the genuine modernizing measures that are being taken. And as I say, do not misunderstand or end up with, the, with what I think would be a completely wrong equivalent um, between the position of the Iranian regime on the one side and what's happening in Saudi Arabia today. So let's talk about Iran if we can. For a moment, um, uh, uh, this is um, one of the great Middle East debates in in our country about the appropriate way to uh, um, to approach Iran uh, narrowly through the through the nuclear lens, more broadly um, uh, in terms of its regional behavior, how one addresses each of these issues in in the most effective manner, um, uh, uh, pressure versus inducement. Um, What's your advice to the new administration? Yeah, it's difficult. I mean, the really difficult questions are around sequencing. But look, my view again, and you know, the people who strongly disagree with this, Iran is a negative destabilizing force across the Middle East. I mean, if you had a reasonable regime in Iran, I would double my optimism overnight. And the truth is, in virtually every single arena of the Middle East, they play a role that is harmful, 
that supports the most extreme elements, that prevents countries making progress towards those things I was talking about earlier, rule-based economies, religiously tolerant societies. So I start from that proposition, I'm afraid. And as I say, some people would disagree with me strongly, but that is my view. Um, I believe it very, very strongly. Now, the problem is, on the one hand, the Iranian regime internally has been hard hit by the policies of the last few years. On the other hand, the abrogation of the treaty, the JCPOA, has enabled them to accelerate their nuclear program. So I understand the dilemma that the new administration has. What I'd say is the following, that whichever way they approach it, first of all, they have to keep intact the basic bottom line, which is Iran will not acquire and will not be allowed to acquire nuclear weapon capability. Secondly, in whatever sequence, they have to raise the behavior of Iran across the region, because that is a that behavior is as much a problem for the countries as the region of the region as the nuclear weapons capability is. Indeed, you'll speak to many people across the region will tell you it's a bigger problem for them. And thirdly, we should, as I was saying earlier, keep supporting those modernizing elements. And those modernizing elements include elements within Iran who want to push for greater freedom there. And we should stand by them when they do. I think the other thing, and my institute has done a lot of work on this recently, is to expose the activities, particularly the IRGC, because that has become a more important um, dimension to Iranian misbehavior across the region. And we need to expose it and keep up pressure on it. Um, I just on a, a point you just made, um, there's always been a debate here about uh, what we should do, what uh, Western countries, what our government should do in the event Iranians do um, stand up and uh, uh, as has happened on occasion um, uh, and the people of Iran standing up and demanding more freedom. Um, uh, 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 when that occurs next time, is there something that we should do differently than, than we've done in the past? We should support them. I mean, we, we, we should, I mean, I, I'm not suggesting we try and visit regime change from the outside. I'm not suggesting that, but, you know, the, the, the protests in Iran, which, you know, quite a few people died, by the way, uh, last year. Um, you know, those protests are reaching larger numbers of people. They're moving way beyond the, the liberal middle classes in, in, in Iran. Uh, people are suffering economically there. They're suffering from the way that the IRGC is increasingly controlling the economy. Yeah, we should support those people. I mean, it, it's how we do that is obviously a, a difficult matter and to be decided as, as you see events unfold. But, but there shouldn't be any doubt, there shouldn't be any hesitation on our part. And, you know, I think that would be expected by Iranian people. And the other thing I think we should bear in mind is these revolutions always come to an end. This Islamic revolution in Iran will finish at some point. Now, at some point when, I don't know. But, but the fact is it will because it isn't sustainable. And the tragedy of Iran is that it's an ancient and proud civilization with enormous strengths as a country. It could be a major, major force for good in the world. Um, and yet its people are just under this iron fist of repression and deprived of economic opportunity. Uh, the, um, the Arab-Israel rapprochements that you've, uh, you've referred to several times um, are in no small part a, a reflection of the common fear of the Iranian challenge. Um, uh, 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 how can we use this how should, do you think, the Biden administration use these new developments um, to advance our interests vis-a-vis -vis Iran? Well, I think the Biden administration will be in a very good place to, to further um, push those, that, that type of, of, of accord within the, within the Middle East. I think they'll find a fairly 
a united front now between the Israelis and the Arabs in the region. I think one thing is really important to point out there, Rob, is that yes, it's true that um, the strategic threat, the common strategic threat of, of Iran has brought Israelis and Arabs closer together. That's absolutely true. But I do think it's important to people because I know this from my own conversations with Arab leaders across the region, including in the last months. They have a genuine respect for Israel above and beyond Israel's military capability in standing up to Iran. They admire its technology, its innovation, how they built the country. And, you know, that's why a lot of what is going on at the moment is, is uh, and with Israelis, by the way, flocking into Dubai and the Emirates and elsewhere, a lot of it is a genuine decision that reason should grip the politics of the Middle East. And what I mean by that is it's always been absurd. <laughs> if, you're, if you're in a position in, in the Arab world and you look at your threats, how would you possibly conclude that the, the one group of people you should be alienating in the region are the Israelis? And one of the things that's happened, and this is what is exciting potentially about the Middle East, is that reason has gripped the politics. And under the leadership of people like Mohammed bin Zayed, who, you know, far-sighted thinkers, have just said, look, I've had enough. This is completely irrational. It's absurd. Of course we should have an alliance. Now, by the way, that doesn't mean to say they've forgotten the Palestinian cause. And one thing I remain completely committed to is a fair deal for the Palestinians. I still believe the two-state solution is the right one. But I think you've got a much, much better chance of making progress on that if you've got that Arab-Israeli cooperation. And I think one of the, the tragedies of Palestinian politics is that they, they have been negative towards this development, whereas I think they should see it as a vast opportunity. So first of all, the idea that rationality is breaking out in the Middle East, I mean, this is almost messianic, but it's great. <laughs> well, I may be completely wrong, of course, but actually it would help a bit of rationality our way as well. But anyway, that's another matter. So you, as much as anyone else, you have the scars to show for your efforts to advance Israeli-Palestinian peacemaking, um, uh, uh, given your yeoman's work is, uh, um, uh, uh, with the quartet and, and before then um, uh, in, your, uh, in your previous position. Um, uh, how would one use this regional progress in a practical sense to advance um, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian uh, dynamic and, and, and how is the right balance of, um, uh, uh, how should, do you think the, the Biden administration should approach this um, in a way to make practical progress? So since leaving office virtually every, with every new secretary of state, I have tried to argue that the Palestinian is a real priority issue and can be resolved. I, worked with Condi Rice on it and worked with Hillary Clinton on it. I worked with John Kerry on it, all of whom are great and talented people. I think this time around, I think the Biden administration rightly will take a step back and, and wait and see a bit. And I think that's probably the right thing to do. But in my view, the reason why I think this Arab-Israeli coming together is the best way to proceed with the Palestinian issue, is that in the end, I think one thing is now very clear. If you want a Palestinian state, Palestinian politics has to change and evolve. It has to see the prospect of an Israeli Arab rapprochement as actually a positive factor so that the because the Israelis for sure do regard a peace with the Arab world as a big strategic prize, but they are much more likely to pursue that prize in alignment with Palestinian interests if the Palestinians are welcoming it and actually bringing them around the table with them, with the Israelis. And thirdly, 
Yes, of course, it requires big changes in his, his Israeli politics attitude to the Palestinian question. But I think that is much easier for, Palest for Israeli politics to handle if Israeli politics sees the Palestinian issue as one in which the Palestinian politics is unifying in favor of peace and the Arab world is not seeing it as preconditional irrespective of the state of Palestinian politics for an agreement between the Arabs and the Israelis, but rather it becomes part of that whole modernization of the Middle East. That's what I think is, is possible to do. So I think there's a limit to what the Biden administration can do in the Palestinian-Israeli question at the very outset. But I have no doubt at all that if we were able to put in place that evolution, unification of Palestinian politics around the process of peace, and that Arab-Israeli rapprochement continues, then there will come an opportunity at some point in the not too distant future when you can move ahead. But one thing is very obvious to me after all my years of, of, of looking at this issue. There is no way the state of Israel is ever going to be threatened into a Palestinian state. Now, I understand the case for a Palestinian state and I make it myself, but I say to, the Palestinians that I interact with all the time. The starting point is an understanding. There is no amount of pressure or threat that is going to get you statehood. It is only if the government of Israel and the state of Israel and the people of Israel think that the Palestinian state that will be created will be securely and safely and properly governed. And that is the challenge. Fascinating. So I'm hearing you um, urge a bit of strategic patience on the part of the Biden administration um, uh, to, to strengthen the regional Arab-Israeli rapprochement, and that will have a, a positive impact on the potential for uh, the, the internal Palestinian dynamic, which is an essential element of moving forward. That's what I think at home. But, but it's, you know, none of that means that you don't you don't support the Palestinian cause, but as I will say to people that what is needed for the Palestinians is a strategy for statehood, not a strategy for sympathy. You know, you can tour the world and get, get the sympathy, but if you're, if you're looking at the hard-headed reality of how you achieve independent government for the Palestinians, a state for the Palestinians, you know, the truth of the matter is there are three groups of people who can help you get it. The Americans, the Israelis and the Arabs. I mean, the Europeans can play their part and, you know, other countries around the world can push and cajole and pass resolutions, but those are the three groups that can deliver or help deliver statehood. And what you can't do is have a strategy which disengages from the Americans, alienates the Israelis and irritates the Arabs. So I think, there is, with a new administration, the Palestinians can re-engage. I think they will want to do that. But I do think it's of primary importance for them to seize their own politics and to unify it, not on any basis, but on a basis for peace. Um, this, is, this is fascinating. Um, uh, we're, we're about to run out of time in just a moment. Um, uh, and I have a long list of questions. Um, I did want to ask you if you had a couple of minutes with President Biden, what one or two pieces of advice would you give him right now from your experience dealing with crisis, dealing with leadership in moments of crisis? What are one or two pieces of advice that he deserves? Well, Joe Biden doesn't need any advice from me, frankly. I mean, I've known him for a long period of time and he's immensely experienced himself. I mean, by the way, you've got one of the most experienced teams that, you know, I guess any new administration has ever started with. And I think the other thing that's important about, <clears throat> about the team that he's chosen, and obviously I know over the years, is they also are close to him and close with each other. So in one sense, I'm quite hopeful because I think you'll get a quite a coherent uh, policy response. So I, I, I wouldn't give him any advice, but I would just say to him from the outside is understand the immense yearning 
from America's allies around the world to see America back providing strategic leadership on the world stage. And, you know, whether it's China or Iran or whatever it is, or the pandemic can be, you know, the Europeans, and for these purposes, by the way, I include, <laughs> I include the UK as a European country. You know, on our side of the pond, <clears throat> people will want to work with America. There'll be issues and pressures and friction points, no doubt, but you shouldn't underestimate the intense desire there is to see America recognize that its own enlightened self-interest means strong alliances. Very good. Um, uh, I want to thank you, Mr. Blair, um, for, uh, um, for offering your unique insights at this moment of turbulence and change here in America. It is, um, it, it is, it gives great consolation to know that we have such good intimate friends from abroad um, who, uh, who yearn for American leadership and who are um, uh, uh, friends of America's through thick and thin. Um, uh, I wanna thank you very much. I want to um, uh, urge everyone to go to the website of the Institute for Global Change to check on the um, new essay that was just published today about um, understanding the context of uh, the Middle East um, uh, a decade after the Arab Spring. Um, uh, I want to urge everyone to go to the website of the Washington Institute, where we are beginning to publish a series of transition papers for the new administration. Uh, the first went up a few days ago, Dennis Ross's advice on Iran nuclear diplomacy, and there'll be an entire range of these papers over the course of the next few weeks. Um, uh, I want to thank again, former Prime Minister Tony Blair. Um, uh, 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 it's, a, it's a privilege to host you. I wish you and your family all health and the people of Britain uh, all health uh, as we uh, collectively challenge uh, the pandemic. Um, uh, and um, so therefore it's Rob Satloff signing off from Washington. Thank you very much.